Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the uh, Library of Congress Oral History Project. And uh, we're here at the Public Library of Cincinnati. Uh, Dennis Daly is our videographer, a historian himself. And uh, we have the pleasure and the honor of speaking with Frank Andress this morning. And uh, Frank and I have known each other for a long, long time and uh, I've enjoyed his friendship so much over the years. Uh, Frank, it's an honor to be here with you, and, and uh, what we do is uh, get started. Uh, where were you born? I was born here in Cincinnati. Oh, you were? And uh, uh, tell us about your family. Did you have siblings or? No, I had no siblings. My um, um, father was born here, and mm. the, he, um, um, was at the university, he was a scientist at the University of Cincinnati and he got his um, PhD in biochemistry wow. from the University of Cincinnati and that's a, that was way back in the early years of the depression and um, which was pretty unusual to get a PhD in bio, there weren't many biochemists <laughs> in those days and uh, unfortunately he had a heart attack and died at age 40 oh, dear. so he really was only able to utilize his talents for a yeah. few years before he died. Where and, did you, excuse me, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, where, where did you get your uh, elementary education? Uh, I went to a little school uh, in Wall Hills called Cummins School. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's, the building is still there. It's now a, um, it's been rehabbed into office buildings. And then I went to uh, Wall Hills High School for mm -hmm. six years. And I graduated from there in 19... 44, I think my graduation was almost the same day as D-Day, which I'll never forget as long as I live. I, should say. I had a car in those days and I was driving to school for a final exam and on my radio of my car was the announcement of the D-Day invasion. And I think um, really in, in my, uh, I'm 82, and in the course of my lifetime, I think <clears throat> World War II was probably the most transcendent event Absolutely. of my lifetime. It's, it's, it's an awesome uh, event, what actually happened in that um, D-Day invasion was, of course, one of the uh, apexes, I guess you'd say, of the, uh, of the war. But then I graduated from Bone Hills in uh, June of 1944, and then I went into the service. Now, mm -hmm. you, I know you're interested in people because of their service-related activities. Well, we like to know also about your, let's go back just a little bit, and in your school days as a schoolboy and so forth, did you have any particular interests or hobbies or uh, did you belong to clubs and so forth in school? And Well, I think I, my, I guess my particular hobby <laughs> was building model railroads. Oh boy. And um, I had a rather extensive O gauge in those days it was O gauge, later it was HO. I, I have built several model railroad systems over the years, both uh, O and HO, which is half the size of O. The, um, um, but that, that was a, a major hobby of mine. And then I was also on the uh, swimming team and the football team at uh, Walnut Hills Wall High Hills. School. In those days I was skinny, very skinny. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, they could knock me over pretty easy on the football team. So you played in the, and swam for the Eagles, huh? Exactly, <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's great. Well, Walnut Hills is a great school and still is. Oh, but it is. I'm, I'm very pleased to see the, uh, that they're maintaining their academic levels standards. and their uh, uh, selection process yeah, is I still being retained, and I think it's that's a major asset of this community. Well, it certainly is. It is. It's a great feeder for uh, future leaders and so forth. Um, there are certain times in a person's life that stand out. Uh, uh, where were you on uh, December the seventh, nineteen forty-one? You remember that date? Yes, it was a Sunday, if you recall, and um, the. Um, I was at home. Uh, my father had died at that point. He died in 1940. Oh dear. Um, the um, but I remember rather vividly in the um, attack on on Pearl Harbor, which was almost incredulous uh, at the time. The um, 
And I remember going downtown with my mother the following day, which was a Monday shopping, and the uh, newsboys in those days would sell newspapers on the corners, you know, and they'd, of course they had these enormous headlines, and the um, newsboys yelling, uh, war, world war, uh, let's see, U.S. declares war, I guess it was, mm -hmm. on Germany and, and uh, Japan. Dramatic, dramatic events. Uh, but anyhow, it was uh, at home uh, uh, the, the very day of the uh, incident. Sure, very unforgettable. Well, um, as you, uh, uh, of course, in 41, you were still in high school. Right. And um, uh, were you looking ahead to possible military service at that time? Well, in 41, I think I was more interested in girls and sports yeah. than I was in the war. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And I had a girlfriend, and I was involved with some things at the sure. school. And um, the, um, it really wasn't until 1943, uh, of course, the war was very much in, its, in everyone's mind by, by then, uh, but I applied, by, pardon me, I took a, an academic test at Walnut Hills for the Navy Air Corps, mm -hmm. which was called V-5, Navy right. Air Corps, and I passed. And they invited me to Chicago for three days of physical exams um, the, uh, at the um, Naval Station, uh, at uh, Great Lakes Naval Station, as it was. And uh, anyhow, we were up there for three days of um, physical exams, which were very, very comprehensive, as you can imagine. Looking for a pilot, I remember, for example, sitting in a totally uh, dark room and having two sticks at the far end of the room, and I had to bring them in alignment in a totally dark room, which of course, eye testing, and eyes were a very critical element. I think they would have liked me to be a little shorter. I was a little bit tall, but uh, I'm almost 6'3". But anyhow, I took those tests over three days and I passed, and then that's when I knew I was gonna be going into the Air Corps right. uh, after school was over with. Well, so, uh after after high school, uh, June of uh, forty four, uh, then where were you sent? Well, yeah. I was probably as far away from combat as it was possible to be and still be in the service. They <laughs> sent me to college because they didn't want any uneducated pilots, and I guess they thought someone with a high school only was still uneducated. <laughs> <clears throat> so they sent me to college at a school in West Virginia. There were hills of West Virginia called Bethany. Bethany College, you may never have heard of it. It's a small liberal arts school in the mountains of West Virginia. Charming, idyllic place uh, with a huge coal mine right next to the football field, <laughs> the, uh, which was one of the main sources for the school's uh, uh, budget. But anyhow, I went there for a year, uh, and I happened to come across, my wife found today, or yesterday, the Bethany Log, which is the uh, <laughs> annual uh, report of all of us at uh, Bethany College, and you can see that um, we had we were we were in a the only difference you can see between us and and uh, other people were that we wore uniforms. Yes, um, it was a all grand those mixture. White hats. Yeah, grand <laughs> mixture of people in uniforms, um, and. Um, women, of course, who were not in uniform. And there were a few uh, young men, there were very few that were uh, not in the service. Um, the, um, but anyhow, they sent me to uh, Bethany College in uh, West Virginia, which is uh, about as safe a place as you could find. Now that was the pre-flight school. Uh, you know, it was really straight college. I oh. took college courses, I took, um, um, Damage control, uh, which was that's that was a, that's a very un, you know uniquely naval damage control on ships. I took a course in um, navigation, great circle calculations and navigation. But I also took courses in um, I think English and um, mathematics. But I was a major in mathematics. I remember taking calculus, which which I found rather difficult, although I. I majored in mathematics at Long Hills High School, <laughs> but the um, it was a it was a very I couldn't have asked for a more pleasant place, 
the Navy treated me very well. I, and um, the, uh, I was there at the time of VE Day, which you'll recall was May of 45. Right. But um, then um, at the end, at, uh, at July 1st, 1945, which is one year later, uh, they weren't about to discharge us, although they were then trying to start to drop people. Well, no, I'll take that back because V J Day wasn't until August, so they were shifting troops from the European theater to the Asiatic theory, the, uh, theater, uh, and they kept me in school, and so I went to another college, and I won't bore you, but they went to Franklin Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and another semester later, I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Midshipman School wow. uh, in Philadelphia, and then I went out to the fleet, the war was over, and they, they wanted us to stay in and take an ensign's commission, and I really wanted to, I was not a militarily inclined, so I opted to go out to the fleet, which is what I, I went out to San Francisco for about uh, three or four months and ran the captain's gig, which is a <laughs> motorboat. The war was over, they didn't know what to do with all the servicemen, and the, the main thing they were trying to do was to not let youngsters like myself, I was 19, get discharged before the veterans, which is fine. I mean, I've, and so we did menial tasks that veterans would otherwise have done, like run the captain's gig. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> How'd you like San Francisco? Oh, I love San Francisco, I was still it, do. In those a, days, I was only 19, I couldn't go into any of the night spots. They wouldn't let me in, because I was too young. So I couldn't even get a beer, and, <laughs> except on the base. You could get a beer on the base. But every weekend, my friend and I used to hitchhike to Yosemite National Park and go hiking and climbing in the mountains of Yosemite, wow. which I did a lot of. What a great experience. But I love San Francisco. I, I, I used to get to San Francisco in business years ago, and I just loved I'd love to stay at that Mark Hopkins and oh, then yeah. jump on the trolley car and go <laughs> over to the Giordelli Square yeah. and have sautéed abalone and a martini. <laughs> oh, boy. The sautéed abalone is almost non-existent. Oh, anymore. I know. I haven't been to San Francisco for a while. Have you been there recently? No, I haven't. It's been quite a number of years since yeah. I was there. And it's, it's changed a bit. But, uh, you know, and of course, San Francisco is a great uh, fleet city. Oh, yeah. Boy, oh, boy. Oh, Sailors. Yeah. Oh, everywhere. Liberty there was just incredible. Well, you were there on, in the middle uh, of the, the Navy? War, yeah. Were you in the yeah. Navy too? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, um, that was made. For, I would have loved to have been there on VJ Day. I would too. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get that. that. It was quite a celebration, I'm told. But um, uh, did you get to fly at all? No. No, the war was over. Right. Uh, as far as the. Um, and they, they had more pilots and they knew what to do oh, with. They had pilots coming out of their kazoo. And um, the, um, uh, so no, I never did get to fly, which I regret. I'm sorry I yeah. uh, didn't get the opportunity to be a pilot. The, um, you're very generous in your, your statements about the Navy taking care of you. Very, and very fair. giving you the opportunity for a good basic education in college and that sort of thing. Right. Um, <clears throat> now, yes. When you went to Franklin and Marshall, uh, was it just sort of a continuation of what you got started with at Bethany? Right. Basically, uh, just more advanced <clears throat> courses and <clears throat> things like navigation and um, seamanship and <clears throat> damage control, as well as traditional sure. academic sure. courses. They, they really wanted, uh, again, I, the Navy did a wonderful job. They wanted someone who was <clears throat> well-rounded academically. I was surprised really at how many uh, traditional academic courses I took, mm -hmm. math and English. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember others. I'm not certain about history, but oh, I'm sure we had, sure we had courses in naval history. Well, I'm sure. <clears throat> I'm which sure. is fascinating in itself. Sure. If you've read anything about the battles of World War II and um, uh, Midway, for example, is an oh, extraordinary yes. story. Right, <laughs> I should say. Well, as you, um, as you progressed through those uh, studies and so forth, uh, as you say, they prepared you very well for, for duty at sea and all that sort of thing. 
what was the talk about going to the Asiatic uh, Pacific Theater? Um, you know, I was, I'll be honest with you, I was so concentrating on my studies in school, um, we were so isolated, really, in those, mm -hmm. those uh, schools, because they were both um, in rather remote areas. Uh, Franklin Marshall was in, I was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania at the time of VJ Day. The um, very isolated, uh, and quite honestly, I, you know, I, I expected to go to the Asiatic Theater and um, the, uh, and many of my friends were already over there, contemporaries were already there with the expectation of being part of the invasion of Japan, which was, you probably know, I think was scheduled for the fall of 1945 or early 46, and then we dropped the atomic bombs, and that was the end. And the, uh, uh, while the atomic bomb dropping was, a, was a, an unfortunate understatement uh, in terms of what it did for the Japanese and the terrible deaths, but uh, it saved hundreds of thousands oh, of American yes. lives oh, yes. that would have been lost in the invasion of Japan and possibly including my own. Right, and, and the Japanese people themselves. There would have been well, tremendous loss. Well, I suppose loss. I hadn't thought of that. Tremendous loss. That the, uh, that the loss they suffered might actually have been less than the, loss, the yeah. loss they would have experienced. Right. I hadn't thought of that. But they were so, they were so uh, as, as, as I was uh, educated to learn about, they were so deeply entrenched, uh, not only physically, but in their minds, they still felt that that the, under the emperor, that they were uh, they were undefeatable, so to speak, but uh, they had already suffered terribly with the firebombing of the cities and so forth. Uh, you were aware of all that sort of thing in the news. Oh yes, yes, sir. I was aware of that thing. Is today I would consider myself a news and editorial junkie, but <laughs> in those because I have a lot of time, uh, and I read the editorials and the papers uh, rather diligently. But in those days, when I was in school, I was so, frankly, so, <laughs> the, the demands for uh, study were so considerable. The, um, uh, we were aware of it, you couldn't avoid it, of course, sure. but it isn't something where we turn on the evening news. Those <laughs> days we didn't have television. That's right. Uh, we had radio only. The, um, so uh, I, I'm, today I would consider myself better informed than I was in those days. Well. That, that's the way it was uh, for all of us, of course. And, uh, but there was, as you, you pointed out, the, the, the iconic uh, position of World War II in the 20th century uh, was absolutely, as we look back on it today. Oh, absolutely. I still cannot, I'm overwhelmed today when I think of the number of people who died. Yes. Um, I have a, um, my ancestry is from northern Germany, and uh, I had some cousins, or a, a cousin, I should say, a cousin in the, in the uh, German army. And he had a brother-in-law who was at Stalingrad and was captured by the Russians, and I had communication. I was in Germany uh, as a, uh, after I got out of college in 1949 and went to uh, Europe. For about six months, I was really interested in seeing uh, what Europe was like, particularly in view of the war. And of course, Germany in 1949 was um, many that I can never will forget going to Cologne. And the only thing standing even in 1949 was the Cologne Cathedral, which had been partially saved. Right. But everything else was absolute rubble, absolute rubble as far as you could see. And this was 1949. The, um, but anyhow, those things were uh, made an enormous impression on me. Well, you've had a distinguished career in banking and, uh, and business leadership in, here in Cincinnati. Um, <clears throat> how, did you, how did you feel about, uh, say, the Marshall Plan and uh, our plans <clears throat> for reconstruction of I wrote of my your... senior thesis on the Marshall Plan. Did you really? Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a very, very positive uh, move. I was, uh, I, I came back to UC and finished up at the University of Cincinnati, got my bachelor's degree in 
uh, economics and mathematics, as a matter of fact. The, um, but my senior thesis was on the Marshall Plan, and I, was, I thought it was a dramatically positive move for a, um, an area of the world that was just devastated. And you know, I think it's interesting, I, I believe this is a correct statement, you know all those funds have since been repaid. We all uh, get upset about the uh, outlay, <laughs> yes. but those funds have, were subsequently repaid, I believe, even with interest. Right. Outstanding, and of course, uh, <clears throat> our our philosophy about uh, restoring our former enemy to a, a balanced status in the world, and of course, a com country like Germany. I mean, you can't ignore something that isn't some little Balkan state. It, it, it has always been tremendous. Our former enemies, the Germans and the Japanese, are two of the most democratic countries in the world today, yes. thanks to our restoration. Absolutely. And you know, interestingly enough, you know, uh, uh, General Marshall came out of the family in uh, Augusta, Kentucky. Did oh, you I know didn't that? know that. I didn't know his background. As a matter of fact, if you go to the little <laughs> town of Augusta now, they have a monument there to the Marshalls. Oh, do They're they? Two or three generations back, his, his, uh, his forebears uh, came out of Augusta. I've, I've been to Augusta. That's that very quaint little town. There's a, a you can take a boat across the yeah, Ohio River. Yeah, take the ferry. Ferry boat. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah. been to Augusta. I've been to that inn. Yeah. And um, I belonged to the literary club, and we had a literary club outing there once. Oh, once. Uh, uh, Nick Clooney. Yes. Uh, I believe lives there. Yes. And then he set it up. The, um, but anyhow, it's, it's, uh, I didn't realize that Marshall yeah. was from Augusta. Yeah. Uh, in your travels, in your post-war travels. Um, of course, when you got to Germany, and you're telling about the, the utter destruction that you witnessed, um, that was beginning to be about the time, well, wait a minute, I'll take it back, the um, Berlin Airlift. Did you Berlin have Berlin Airlift was on when I was there. Yeah, the 1948. We went to um, the checkpoint, and um, I, well, this cousin that I referred to mm -hmm. that was been in the German Army, he and I toured Germany together oh, in 49, what a um, which thing. was great because he spoke fluent German, being, of course, German. The, uh, but we, I remember seeing those planes. Uh, I think the, the Berlin Airlift started in 1948. 48. And, um, the, um, and I was there in 49, and the, mm -hmm. the, uh, I remember going to the um, checkpoint, and I think it might have been called Helmstadt, the, um, and that you could go no farther. Uh, you couldn't go into Eastern Germany, and um, I think the um, I think the wall was later. The wall went up later, mm -hmm. but I've, I've seen subsequent years. I was in um, West Berlin when the communists were still in control of East Germany, and went to the wall, um, which was an awesome sight because there are lots of um, of uh, little. Um, displays of flowers and crosses for oh, people. Yes. I can't think of the right word. People memorials. Who, memorials, thank mm -hmm. you. There were lots of memorials on the wall, uh, at the base of the wall, for people who'd been murdered by the um, communist guards trying to escape. And then in 1990, I was in East Germany, again, on a trip, and we went to the Berlin Wall and had the pleasure of smashing the Berlin Wall with hammers. You really did that? Yeah, I've had, I have the pieces of the Berlin Wall at home. We, uh, <laughs> we were there, if you recall, the wall came down in November of 1989, and we were there in June. We had gone with a minister from our church to the um, Martin Luther Church in Wittenberg. Mm -hmm. It was, that was part of the trip. And then we went from there to, um, um, Berlin, and had the pleasure of walking through the wall and smashing uh, <laughs> stones out of the wall because it was still being going through dismantling at the time we were there. And even when we were in Martin Luther's church in um, Wittenberg, they reenacted the wall scene uh, for us by having a group of local members of the parish. And they put big boxes on the altar, and then they and they had candles. 
and in their hands they carried the candles and pushed the boxes over oh. and walked through this imaginary wall. Oh, boy. And then they also played Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, tears came to my eyes. Oh, I'm sure. That was a very, very moving experience. That's one of my favorite hymns. Yes. Uh, Luther's Mighty Fortress is Our God. Well, you have, you certainly have uh, not only witnessed uh, important history, but you've experienced it. And uh, being the sensitive person that you are, you're very aware of, of, um, uh, of the entire aspects. Um, the, t tell us more about your cousin. Is he still with He's you? He's still very much alive. I um, exchange emails with him. <clears throat> we were just in, we just came back from um, Eastern Europe. Uh, we were in, um, went down the Danube and uh, <coughs> from uh, Budapest to the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping that he was going to join us, but um, I didn't know how we exchanged some emails, but he couldn't make it. But he lives in um, Bremen, Germany. He's retired from the, um, some big electric company. Uh, he was an engineer. Mm -hmm. The um, very delightful gentleman. He's visited us here in Cincinnati oh, and, nice. and at our home up in Leland, Michigan. He's been our guest up there and also here in Cincinnati. Um, and he used to get to the States about every oh, eight or ten years, uh, but his wife's uh, knee problems uh, restrict his travel now. But he's doing fine. He's, he's so? fine. He skis. He sails. Uh, he's in better shape than I am. <laughs> <laughs> he's We're about the same age. Same age. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Now, is his name Andres? No, it's Becker. My um, um, ancestral name was Becker. Mm. Um, the uh, his first name is Heiner. <laughs> Heiner Becker, but that's pretty German, isn't it? That's really Can't Deutsch. Get any more than that. But he speaks <laughs> fluent English. Oh. His English is 100% better than my German, I'll tell you. <laughs> he's really, he's an outstanding young man. I, not, he, he was outstanding young man, um, but uh, he survived the, he survived World War II without injury. He was in Austria, captured by the British, okay. and uh, because of his English, speaking ability, he was used as an interpreter oh. by the British right after World War II. Mm. Uh, and then he was subsequently released, mm. went back to um, some technical school and got a degree in engineering in Germany. And Did he have anything to do with the Nuremberg trials? No, no, uh, no, that, he was not. That was not. He was not involved in Nuremberg. Right, right. Well, that, that, that's tremendously interesting. and. And I think you're the first uh, interviewee that we've had here who had a relative who fought on the opposite side. That's you know, I had this, there's a funny story, really. Good. Uh, there were more than, I just only referred to Heiner, but there were some others too, who were actually captured and incarcerated as POWs in Texas. And um, they had the, uh, these ants I had, I had five or six ants or great ants, I guess they were great ants, five or six great ants who had all emigrated here from Germany. Mm. Um, and they were sending um, all sorts of uh, gifts to these POWs in Texas, German POWs in Texas, and this one second cousin here in Cincinnati who was American but uh, first generation or second generation American, his name was Lawrence Dangelmeyer. He's now deceased. Lawrence Dangelmeyer was in the Seabees in the Pacific. And he says, you know, all those grannies and aunties, they sent all those that coffee and chocolate to the POWs in Texas. And I was in the South Pacific with the Seabees and I didn't even get a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Oh, gosh. Well, speaking of that, of course, uh, I had a lot of experience in the South Pacific, but uh, the CBs were such uh, a great, great outfit. That's what I understand. And, oh, and they accomplished so much, yeah. Did you, you knew him? Oh, I know I knew him very well. He lived yeah. over in um, <clears throat> northern Kentucky and... Um, I'll be darned. 
He had a career in the insurance business. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a little older than I am, Lawrence. So if he were alive today, would be about 91. So he was a bit ahead of me. Right. Um, he, um, but anyhow, he had, um, he was with the CBs and survived without any injury. Right. Well, you, you've had, uh, you certainly have uh, interesting uh, connections and background and everything. Uh, Frank, over the years, uh, you've served your community here so well in many aspects. Um, when you came back from the war, uh, how did you get started back in your hometown? Well, when I came back, um, I had to finish my education. <clears throat> and um, I, I, so I went to the University of Cincinnati and um, um, finished my education in economics and math. That was a class of what? 49. 49. Then it was, it was subsequent to that uh, graduation. I went to Europe for six months because I was so interested in what had happened over there. I then um, went to Harvard Business School in the uh, in September of 1950, and um, was married at that time to Janet, um, who that's 58 years ago. We're still still married. Hmm. Amazing, she's put up with me all these years. <laughs> but um, she's a great. We lady. went off to um, Cambridge, and we lived in Cambridge. Um, I got an MBA from Harvard Business School, and then I worked for one of my professors for um, two years. Uh, at the Pentagon, as a matter of fact, oh, that was an interesting. It, it is relevant to this conversation, I believe. Absolutely. Um, he, um, I was supposed to go back in the service uh, because the Korean War was on then. Oh yes. And uh, you know we had uh, World War II and then the Korean War. We've had so many. It's it's frightening. The um, I was supposed to go into the Air Corps. Um, this is this is the the traditional Air Corps, not the Navy. Um, uh, in um, June of 1952, when I graduated from Harvard Business School, the, um, and one of my professors said, I need, I'd like you to come work for me. There's a professor there at school. Uh, and I said, well, I have to go in. I'd love to work for you, but I have to go in the service and have my service obligation again. And uh, he said, well, I'll get you a deferment because I'm working on military logistics problems. And uh, since I'd had this heavy math uh, training, um, that was sort of natural. And so anyhow, he called the Air Force, and a day later he said, you're out, and you're going to work for me. <laughs> so I worked in the uh, Pentagon on military logistics problems for two years. I lived in Cambridge, but I, every Monday or every Sunday night, I'd fly to Washington and, and work on military logistics problems, particularly the problems of procurement of um, jet engines, uh, the how you price a jet engine, uh, how you price uh, all the electronic controls, how you price an airframe. It's very, it's a lot of number crunching as you can imagine. Right. And we were trying to help, it was very difficult, but it was, we were trying to help the military figure out uh, systems for the pricing of these complex items. Which is, uh, which is what I did for two years. So that's uh, sort of trying to relate to what you asked a minute ago. That's fascinating. I had no idea that you did that. And uh, so you had a lot of contact with the military in the Pentagon. Yeah, by, as a civilian, I worked as for them. As a civilian, yes, they, of course. Uh, they they, they uh, hired uh, my professor who hired me. Right. And he had several of us. I was just one of his flunkies. I see. He had several <laughs> flunkies, and um, with similar backgrounds. And uh, we we had an office there in Cambridge, um, of the uh, Cambridge Trust. The um, and uh, but I enjoyed that. It was very interesting work. Did you come up against uh, in contact with any people like uh, General Vandenberg or anything? Like no, that. no, my work was primarily with the people who were doing procurement of complex nice. electronic, uh, particularly airframes and aircraft engines and electronics. How about GE Evendale? Uh, well, they were, some t they were frequently the supplier, uh -huh. and we were frankly helping the military um, to uh, be able to understand these complex proposals 
try to simplify the process of what's a fair price and how do you protect the United States government from being overcharged. Sure. Um, and we had various types of contracts, one of which was the incentive type contract, which we championed. Um, and when Robert McNamara became Secretary of De Defense uh, under Kennedy, which I believe would be in 1960, um, hey, that's right, mm -hmm. I think it's 60, mm -hmm. um, he um, very much championed this contract, which we had, I don't want to say we originated, but we uh, recognized its virtues and uh, pushed it very strenuously. And uh, Robert McNamara, the <clears throat> Secretary of Defense, must have come to similar conclusions because he was pushing it. I won't go through the details, but essentially it gave the contractor an incentive to be efficient. And if he was efficient and you had to measure how you measure efficiency, um, he got a better profit than if he was inefficient. Of course. And if he was too inefficient, he could lose money. And that was basically what we were trying to do. That was a little bit before the time of the uh, so-called, uh, what was it, the $20, $27 hammer or remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a long before that. <laughs> the old overpriced. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess those evils still occur. Yes. And um, it's, I must say, it's not easy if you, when you think about um, coming up with a whole new military piece of hardware and designing it and oh, yes. costing it and, and preventing that. They do have, um, they do it away with it. One time during World War II, they had contract renegotiation um, so that uh, the auditors from the government could come in subsequent to the completion of the contract and do an audit mm -hmm. of the contractor's expenses. And the unfortunate thing about that is that almost anything they wanted to put in the um, cost structure was, was, it was hard to, to, to disallow it. And, um, but that was, a, that was designed to be a safeguard on this uh, matter. Well, that certainly was, uh, <clears throat> certainly was um, strengthening your career as well. And then uh, was it after the Pentagon stint that you returned to Cincinnati into business? Right, I did. I, uh, uh, in, the, um, in 1954, I took a job with the Kroger Company here in Cincinnati uh, as a, I guess as an analyst in, a, in the financial department and um, worked for my um, now still alive dear friend John Lockhart who's 97 years old <laughs> and um, still very uh, alert. I have lunch with him periodically. Good. But um, I worked in the, for the Kruger Company and I was um, in the finance department and I was later controller of the company and then I was assistant treasurer and I was director of finance. My job was primarily financing warehouses, shopping centers, stores, raising the money right. to um, do the financing for warehouses and so, so you forth. were in, you were involved in this great expansion of that great. Well, company. I remember the first time I went to Wall Street. I went with John, and um, I think I was there primarily to carry his briefcase. <laughs> he, um, but we were borrowing twenty million dollars. This is 1955, we were borrowing $20 million. And I said, you know, John, the, the um, most money I've ever borrowed in my life was $14,000 for the mortgage on my present home. <laughs> and he said, John, Frank, he said, the um, only difference between the $14,000 mortgage and the $20 million uh, bank loan we were securing is that with the $20 million loan, you get a free lunch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> he has a good sense of humor. I should he say. He still does. I remember him very well. Yeah. Yes, yes, wonderful man. And uh, the, uh, as you progress through, well, wait a minute, let me reflect back just a little bit about um, the Korean War period. Uh, how did you feel about uh, old Harry Truman as President of the United States? How did I feel about Harry Truman? Yeah, succeeding Roosevelt. Um, I was not a Roosevelt fan and never have been, but no. um, I thought Truman was remarkably decisive 
and making a very, very tough decision to drop the atomic bomb. That was a very, very difficult. He must have lost a lot of sleep over oh, that. Yes. Yes. But I thought he was remarkably decisive in how he dealt with that problem, unlike, uh, you know, I think Roosevelt, among other things, gave the store away at Potsdam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But I, I liked Truman a lot. I thought he was very decisive. You lost your microphone, oh, right? Yeah, can you clamp it back on your on my lapel there? That's, yeah, sure. That's great. That's all you have to do. Sure. You squeeze it and let it get. That way we won't lose your your wonderful narration here. Um, so, yeah, that that's that's interesting that you say that because uh, I think um, in general we feel that that Truman. Uh, as you say, was a very decisive person and, uh, and made uh, some tremendous decisions over the years. The, um, so now, let's see, your years in Kroger were right through that period of great expansion and, and formative uh, status of the business in the industry. Well, Kroger went from being number three uh, supermarket chain Safeway and uh, Atlantic and Pacific. A&P mm -hmm. was number one, but they had a lot of little rinky-dink stores. Right. And Safeway, which had big stores, uh, was number two, and we were number three. Um, today, I believe Kroger is the largest supermarket oh, right. chain in the country, although Walmart is also an enormous factor in, in grocery products. The um, but we did, we bought, I remember we bought the Crambo chain in um, um, north of Milwaukee. We bought Crambo, we bought the Cramlicks out. Uh, I was involved in, in, in that acquisition. <laughs> and then um, we bought a company with a crazy name called Hanky Pilot in uh, Houston. And then we bought the Wyatt food store chain in Dallas. Um, and then we bought another Another one in um, Texas. Uh, Texas uh, was growing very rapidly. Uh, this is in the 50s and 60s. And um, so our, our purchase, and then we tried to buy um, Bastis supermarkets in Phoenix. And um, I remember in the process, we, as an interim step, we loaned the Bastis supermarkets. Um, I think it was about $15 million as a means of trying to get our foot in the door. And I remember uh, going to Phoenix to sign up that deal. And believe it or not, the members of the family who had this big successful chain couldn't write their name. And they would put an X down and then really? someone would authenticate their signature. For and him. yet they had a chain of about 15 very large supermarkets. And of course, Phoenix was growing like mad and still right. is, I guess. <laughs> But um, run into some interesting characters. I should say you have. The, uh, the supermarket business um, today is considerably more sophisticated, of course. Mm -hmm. And I think Kroger's doing a wonderful job. Oh I, my goodness. I shop in that store in Hyde Park Plaza regularly, and I, I thoroughly enjoy that, <laughs> going in that store. I do too. Yeah, it's a great one. Well, um, uh, tell us some more about your. Your civic involvements, uh, you've been a leader in, uh, in the arts and uh, so forth and so on. Uh, how did you and Janet uh, get involved in things like that here? Well, she's been involved in several things. She's very active in the Salvation Army. And um, she, um, has, uh, she was a member of the Junior League for many years and uh, was, uh, did volunteer work there. And I know there's some other things she's, well, she's done a lot of work at Knox Presbyterian Church in Hyde Park. Um, and still is very active in the uh, Salvation Army uh, Camp Swanetki, I think it's mm -hmm. called. And uh, my involvement was with the United Appeal. I was chairman of the Finance Committee of the United Appeal, and I think the United Appeal is a wonderful institution. The, um, uh, and then, um, Oh gosh, I've had other, other, uh, say, uh, well, then I was, um, currently I'm on the board of the Cincinnati Opera, and I've been, matter of fact, I'm going at noon today, I'm having a meeting 
uh, on Cincinnati Opera Matters on the Finance Committee right. uh, investment program. They, um, they, uh, and I, I mean, there were some other civic activities I was involved in that I'm, I'm standing in love. I also am a mentor, pardon me, I'm a tutor at the East End uh, Adult Education Center on Eastern Avenue, uh, and I tutor high school dropouts in math, oh. which is very satisfying because I'm say. you're helping people who are trying to help themselves. Right. And um, the um, but the um, anyhow, I, I tutor uh, periodically when mm -hmm. I'm in town. Um, well, that's a great contribution. Uh, that, that certainly is is. Uh, Exemplary. Um, the uh, how, how do you feel about the economics of the day, for example? Today? Yeah. Well, I'll give you. I'm deeply, and that's what I'm going to be going to at noon today, <laughs> as the right. president, not the president, the head of the Western Southern Investment Committee, is speaking at the University Club, uh -huh. and I'm taking two other members of the Cincinnati Opera Board. Um, to that meeting, and I am, I am writing a paper for the Literary Club uh, entitled, which will be given December 15th, quote, why the chickens have finally come home <laughs> and where to from here. Uh -huh. um, and I'm just getting started on it because I have to have it ready by the, by the 10th of December. I am deeply, deeply concerned about what's going on at the moment. Right. I've been very active in sending um, emails opposing the bailout of General Motors, which is very much on the docket at the uh, Senate and the House right in the Congress. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about that. I even uh, almost daily, just in this morning's Wall Street Journal, I read the Wall Street Journal every day, uh, not cover to cover, but I read a fair amount of it. The um, uh, insurance companies are now buying small banks mm -hmm. so that they can qualify to get under the uh, uh, bailout. Uh, AIG <sighs> has gone from 85 billion to 150 billion in its uh, bailout. Um, General Motors wants to get bailed out, as well as Chrysler and Ford. I think that would be an absolute disaster, and. Uh, because there's no end to people who are going to be standing in line. Absolutely. The, auto, the, automo, the automobile parts suppliers have already indicated that if General Motors gets money, they want to get money. Mm -hmm. So then the question is what happens to other uh, foreign automobile manufacturers who feel like they might be, uh, I mean, who have major plants here and take that Georgetown, Kentucky plant of Toyota. It's, it's awesome. I've been into it, been through it. It's an awesome plant. Um, highly automated, but anyhow, they employ thousands of uh, people down there, and, and Mercedes and BMW have plants here in the United States. I think Nissan does. Aren't they going to feel like they're entitled to money if the uh, big three get it and the are the, are the auto suppliers, part suppliers? The um, I think that this just opens Pandora's box, and I think Frank and I'm I'm a fairly active investor, and uh, at the moment I have give you. I have a 20% exposure to the stock market at this moment, and I'm wondering if I shouldn't be at zero, mm -hmm. especially if this thing goes through with the mm -hmm. automobile. I don't think there's any bottom to this thing. I'm really very, very concerned. Uh, well, that uh, I, I really expected that from you, and I, but I want, <clears throat> wanted you to uh, talk about that a bit. Um, you know. You said it several times about what an impression the Navy training made on you. And uh, do you feel that that really had any significant uh, contribution to your uh, life uh, as you look back on it now? Well, they, I think they exposed me to some good educational training mm -hmm. at three pretty good schools, uh, Bethany, Frank, Franklin Marshall and the University of Pennsylvania especially are, are uh, well known for uh, being good academic institutions. Exactly. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful, and then, you know, I also was 
I, the government treated me very, very well. Besides the Navy, mm -hmm. I was eligible for the GI Bill of Rights. I was going to ask. GI you. Bill paid my uh, uh, college education after I got out of the service, and it paid my way through Harvard Business School, including yes, a monthly living allowance. It was a wonderful program. Uh, it's a very, and I think it made a, for all the people like myself, the veterans who got the GI Bill, many of whom were much more entitled to it than I was. Um, the, um, I think it was a very, very positive influence on the subsequent prosperity of the United States. They have all these trained minds that would, in many cases, have been unable to afford uh, uh, that kind of education. I remember friends of mine who became doctors when they were 23 and 24 because of the acceleration programs. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Anyhow, I thought it was, I thought the uh, combination of the college training I got with the Navy and the um, uh, GI Bill of Rights that the government gave me subsequently uh, were enormously positive factors in my life. Yes, I am very grateful for the Navy and to the government. And I, I get critical of the government uh, sometimes and then I remember Currently, I'm a beneficiary of Social Security <laughs> and Medicare, and uh, so uh, and the GI Bill of Rights uh, after World War II. So I've had my finger in the in the pot too. Um, it's um, so there are there are some there are some programs I I have to remind myself that yeah, I'm I know. From. And, and when we really think about it, we have to realize that that is socialization in a degree too. Oh yes. Definitely, and uh, we have to be very careful how, how we talk about things like that. But uh, that, that's wonderful of you to, uh, to uh, exposit yourself that way because uh, we are in this interview, you know, this is a, here again, is a government sponsored uh, program sure. from the Library of Congress. And uh, you're going to get a DVD of this interview for oh, you and how your nice. family. Oh, well, thank and, you. And uh, so even after you're gone, you're going to be uh, available to your uh, children and grandchildren to, to see uh, uh, Grandfather Frank and uh, hear him talk. And uh, a copy will be here in our archives in the Public Library of Cincinnati. And a copy will be sent to the Library of Congress archives. And uh, you'll be on the website too. So, this is uh, uh, again Frank Andrus is making a, a tremendous contribution to our community, and uh, people will be able to study you over the years and uh, and hear about what you've had to say, and that's that's very important. And coming out of World War II, which we've both talked about. Um, that very, very tremendous, the biggest, uh, the biggest part of, of uh, the 20th century, no question about it. Uh, you know, we, uh, 16 and a half million people served. In Is World that right? In here, just in the United States? Yeah. I didn't realize 16 that. and a half million. Wow, I didn't realize Americans. it was that big. I would have thought it was much smaller than that. I know the casualties were maybe a half a million, weren't there? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, about I don't know whether that's fatalities or casualties. I'm about 600,000, yeah, right. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, in those days, Frank, uh, we barely had 120 million people in our, in our national that's population. True. And for 16 and a half million of them to be a part Staggering. of it. Staggering. Absolutely. Uh, do you remember anything about the, uh, uh, the tough days uh, before you got into the service, about rationing and things like that? Your family, yes, your mother? Yes, I remember um, that we couldn't take a summer vacation uh, <laughs> because of, uh, well, we used to go up to Canada and uh, from the month of August, my dad was professor and he had, um, um, he um, had the month of August off. Uh, we couldn't go up there. Well, he was deceased by that time anyhow, but uh, you, you were racing on gasoline, you were sure. racing on tires. Um, I don't recall food as being a uh, problem, but I do recall uh, gasoline. We had those, uh, we, were, we, were, we were only qualified to have an A sticker. A sticker. Um, and I used to envy my friends whose fathers, for example, were doctors and they had 
unlimited gasoline. <laughs> and so we rode in their cars instead of mine. Um, but uh, yeah, gasoline and, and tires were, uh, right. were a particular difficulty. Fortunately, we had bought a new car in 1941, so we, uh, we had reasonably good transportation during the war. Um, the, um, and, yeah, that was 19, yeah, I'm trying to get my, yeah, 1941. Um, so you've, you had an early, uh, early experience with going to Michigan, going north in the summertime and that sort of thing. That, right, we, that, uh, as a boy. Uh, we started going to um, uh, Ontario when I was about uh, three or four. And mm. then um, my wife and I bought a place in uh, Leland, Michigan many years ago, and, and our oldest daughter has a place there now. So we, we spend our summers up there. I'm retired, of course, and yes. we spend, um, we were up there for four months. We just got home about- Wow, uh, that's uh, great. We were there um, since 1st of uh, July, and we got home in late October. Mm -hmm. But- Well, that, that is, that is, uh, You've had you've had a a great great life, Frank, and you've made a tremendous contribution not only to our local community but to our nation uh, through your varied experiences in uh, <clears throat> the Pentagon and uh, and of course uh, with your MBA and uh, your vast knowledge vast knowledge and understanding of economics, which is so very important. Thank you. I, I appreciate your comments. One thing I didn't mention, which is re relevant to this point, I was on the Hoover Commission oh, yeah. in the early 50s, which was the Hoover Commission in Washington to try and again make the government more efficient. And um, Joe Hall was the president of the Kroger Company at that time, and he was a commissioner, and he wanted someone basically to hold his, his uh, um, briefcase and go to Washington when he <laughs> couldn't go, so I was his... Uh, Aaron Boy between Cincinnati and Washington, but I did get a nice plaque from the Hoover Commission for Wonderful. my work. But it was an interesting task. Uh, um, we were so. getting the government out of competition with private industry, mm -hmm. and we got the government to shut down the coffee plants and the dry cleaning plants and the paint making plant and the uh, rope making plant, all of which were dinosaurs and uh, <clears throat> unnecessary because the uh, services were available from the private sector. But um, uh, that, that was uh, uh, involvement with the um, government that it was, uh, was gratifying. Well, I should say, well, again, uh, we want to thank you for your contribution to our nation and uh, with your wonderful wife and your children and, uh, and your position in the community. And uh, thank you for submitting yourself to be interviewed. And, uh, My pleasure. I, I hope that you all uh, enjoy the DVD. Frank, it's I will. been a, all right. a great honor. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you so Dad. much. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I enjoyed that's it. it.